all the news from Google I.O. Plus, we discuss who should be in charge of net neutrality and why you should beware of all emails from DocuSign and how to secure your super yacht. All that and a whole lot more coming up on Tech News Today. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today, episode 1770, recorded Wednesday, May 17th, 2017. This episode of Tech News Today is brought to you by Blue Apron, the number one fresh ingredient and recipe delivery service in the country. See what's on the menu this week and get three meals free with your first purchase and free shipping by going to blueapron.com slash TNT. And by Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. When it comes to the big decision of choosing a mortgage lender, work with the one who has your best interest in mind. Use Rocket Mortgage for a transparent, trustworthy home loan process that's completely online at quickenloans.com slash DNT. Welcome to Tech News Today. This is the show where we tell you what you need to know about technology today. I'm Megan Maroney. <laughs> and I'm Nathan Olivares Giles. And today, the biggest tech news of the day really is Google I.O., Google's annual developers conference, which for the second year in a row is taking place in Mountain View, California, a few blocks away from its global headquarters. Last year, Google I.O.'s big theme was AI taking over nearly every aspect of Google's products. And this year, that theme continued. One of the most exciting results of this, in my personal opinion, is that they are imbibing AI in what's called Google Lens. It's not one app per se. Instead, Google Lens is a camera function that will be found in Google Photos, Allo, and various Google apps that will allow the Google Assistant to see what you're looking at and provide search results as a result. It's a bit like the old Google Goggles mashed up with the Google Assistant to offer translations, extract Wi-Fi passwords, recognize places and things to give you relevant information really, really quickly. And I think it looks really, really cool. And it seems like it makes a lot of sense. What, what do you think? Uh, I think it looks cool and it makes sense, but it it is also a little bit creepy, I think, because you think about, okay, no longer remember addresses. I no longer remember phone numbers. Facts I learned in school, I can Google them. And now it's like all of that has sort of like morphed into my eyeballs. I basically don't even need them <laughs> anymore. Like I just, all I need is my Google phone to look at things and tell me what they are. Wow, yeah. I You know, I never thought about how much lazier this could possibly make all of us mm -hmm. until right now. You bring up some really fantastic points. You're welcome. I mean, it's kind of crazy because there was Google Now on tap, which was un unveiled a couple years ago. And if you had a long press of the home button on a stock Android phone, so very few people could actually do this, um, it would like scan what was on your page at the time, recognize thing things, and then give you like proper search results. Um, then there was Google Goggles which could like recognize objects, Google Translate, which never works as good as it should. But there's a bunch of data that they've been collecting for a really long time to kind of put all this together. But of course, things look and work a lot better on the demo stage than they do in real life. Mm -hmm. So I feel like this could go terribly wrong in many, many ways. I mean, we're going to have to try it out first, but I'm a little bit worried about that too. Yeah. I mean, Google Photos is awesome. Like it, it had some rough spots in the mm -hmm. beginning, as mm -hmm. we all remember. Pinterest has a feature like this that, that I've found myself using a lot, but no, it's, it hasn't helped. You know, I've been shopping for furniture. So like you see this, you know, $3,000 uh, chair that you want to have, but you don't want to pay $3,000. So you, you know, you can click the little gray box next to the Pinterest icon if you have this uh, web extension installed. And then, you know, it'll show you all kinds of chairs that look like that, but aren't yeah. $3,000. Yeah. So that, that's been sort of helpful. I've been trying it with, you know, just all the images I see online just for fun, like the picture of Mark Zuckerberg with the cow. Like, I'll see like what images look like this. Weirdly, no <laughs> images look like like this. So I, I can see how this might be helpful in shopping. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. I, I absolutely can see how this can be helpful in, in all kinds of ways. It's unclear whether it says it'll be built into assistant. And as we learned, assistant will be part of like, you'll be able to download assistant on to, its own app yep. on iOS. So starting today, actually, that's yeah. the one thing from IO that you'll be able to do today. All this other stuff, including Google Lens, is coming later this year. Mm -hmm. And I, yeah, I tried to download Google Assistant, but it wasn't available for me yet oh, on my okay. iPhone. Okay. 
Good to know. You know, I'm glad you mentioned Pinterest because aside from Google, they really seem to be the only ones with this kind of massive database of images that people, uh, as well as their own software and algorithms and AI and all that stuff, um, have uploaded into their system, have tagged, have uh, helped them recognize and sort through. Um, you know, Facebook, they did some really interesting things with the camera at F8 this year, but their push was really about social interactions and augmented reality, which makes sense for where they're going with Oculus and trying to be a Snapchat, uh, you know, killer if they can. Um, but this really, you know, the only, I mean, the, the ones who would maybe be the closest would be Pinterest. Mm -hmm. um, and now I do also wonder... <laughs> Uh, if someday this could lead to a resurrection of Google Glass, especially if it's combined with uh, the Tango augmented reality push that Google's been doing for a few years, because actually recognizing what's in front of you, making it useful, that makes a lot of sense for a phone. But eventually we're going to get tired of just like holding our phone in front of everything. Yeah, right? Yeah. And I know I watched you and Stacy um, do the special this morning with the um, keynote. And then I watched Stacy was also on this week in Google. So I can't remember. She said this on one of those, but she used the example of like wanting to hold something, you know, being on a, on a hike and holding up your camera to like a mushroom or something like, can I eat this? Yeah. <laughs> it's like, I don't, trust Google enough in that way, yeah. you know? So it was, I, I don't know. I mean, I guess you could say like, what kind of mushroom is this? Just a catalog for your own mm -hmm. needs. But again, I mean, that that's part of the fun of mushroom hunting. Not that I do that for fun, but <laughs> I imagine. I don't know. If you mushroom hunt for fun. I've heard from my fun, friends. <laughs> I've never tried it myself, but, I you know. I have, I, full disclosure, I have gone mushroom hunting one okay. time in one my time. life. Okay. And it was fun. Um, just to see what was out there and but, then be able to know, like your friend who's like an expert to know. We didn't you, eat any of let's them. Let's see you eat the wrong mushroom. Can you really blame Google at that point or yeah. do you blame the internet? That you is know? that is the biggest question. Google's asking for a lot of trust here if they're just going to have us point our camera at everything, mm -hmm. which I don't know if I want to do that or not, but <laughs> no, still, no. Google wants you to point your camera at everything. Right, yeah. That's where this is going. Yeah, this was only one of the many questions that, that will come up today. So uh, many questions. <laughs> a few months ago, Google first hinted at a tool called Super Chat that will let you pay YouTube creators to do certain things. You could call it a tip jar, I guess. An audience member has been able to, an audience member has been able to pay a certain sum determined by you, so their comment remains on the top of your list of comments. But the new API is a little different. Today, Google announced that developers can program automated triggers for something to happen in real life during a live broadcast. Uh, I guess they had some uh, water balloons being thrown at the sl slow mo guys to be able to use Super Chat on your live stream. Your channel has to be monetized. You must have over a thousand subscribers. You have to be in one of the countries where it's available and you have to be over 18, thank goodness. Um, so this was an interesting feature. I guess you could make like drones fly on your YouTubers. Yeah, they said that you could control like smart home stuff. Like in the demo, they were triggering lights and horns. So... Yeah, I don't know. I it's, don't ever want water balloons thrown at me during our live stream. I, I feel like the tip <laughs> jar itself makes a lot of sense, uh, especially with a lot of uh, YouTubers and uh, folks on Twitch and other live streaming services going to things like Patreon to raise money and basically get paid, uh, you know, donation style uh, for the content they're making from their fans. So if YouTube is going to keep their creators in YouTube and keep them from going over to, to, to Facebook live or to Periscope or to Twitch, you know, rival services. This seems like a great way to do it. Um, allow you to kind of monetize freely as the audience uh, wants, but it also just seems like it could lead to a lot of, I mean, like, how are they going to police this? The trolls asking for terrible things, people, starting live streams and maybe doing things that like shouldn't be done. I mean, already Facebook is struggling with people using Facebook live for violent acts. And, you know, I, I don't know how they're going to police this. Like I could see this going terribly wrong. Yes. Uh, Burke has uh, some plans for super chat. <laughs> this is yes. your wish list. Uh, and robot in the chat room would wants to know if uh, we can super chat with Burke. I think that's a great idea. I think Burke has always loved water balloons thrown at him. So pay me a thousand dollars and your wish is my command Only when it comes to throwing water bottles, water 
balloons. What a bargain. Or, yes, it could go terribly wrong. I've talked about this before. It, you know, like people call it tip jar, but it seems a little bit, um, yeah, it could, you don't, you know, you don't get to just stand in front of someone if you leave them a tip and just like ask them to do things for you. Yeah. In my world. <laughs> weird. That could be weird. Well, after months of rumors and leaks, Google also confirmed today at IO that it is indeed building a standalone VR headset. So unlike high-end VR goggles like Oculus Rift and HTC Vive, this standalone rig won't need to be hooked into a PC and it won't be powered by a phone such as Daydream View and Samsung's Gear VR are. It is a fully self-contained and wireless unit. Google hasn't said how much it'll cost, but Lenovo and HTC are working on building headsets to Google's standalone VR headset standard, and those options are set to go on sale later this year. Both will run on Android, and both will have sensors built into the head units that will use basically cameras and different things to essentially map out the world around you to understand where you're at and where you can move in the real world so that you can play safely in the VR world. Uh, so that's actually sounds like another benefit. You won't have to place, you know, light sensors and cameras and stuff around, well, in my case, my apartment or, or, or the newsroom, cause I have my Oculus Rift set up in our newsroom right now. But, um, you know, I'm kind of excited about this as someone who enjoys VR and has been a little bit of an early adopter, but do you think this is going to make VR go mainstream? I mean, this, this seems like something that VR nerds want like, like me, but I don't know if regular people will still care. I think it depends on the price. And I think that Google in the past has come, you know, they, they know what the price point is for these types of things. So yeah, standalone headset would, would be great um, for, yeah, like it's just less messy. Um, I guess the, the, the tracking is dramatically improved. That's what Clay Bevor said on stage today. Um, they use the, the world sense. So I guess we'll have to see that. I mean, it's just a reference design uh -huh. now, but that's what Daydream was last year at Google I.O. And then, you know, we've seen it in the wild. Um, and it's a great product. I mean, Day Gear VR has improved with the addition of their little controller, but really Daydream, I think, still is the most comfortable and, and best mobile VR version out there. Yeah, and, and yet Jason's just sits on our de on his bookshelf, not yeah. used. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So Definitely a problem. Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, so yeah, it's not it's it's not here. When Leo was talking about it earlier, he's like, you know, I expect it to, he expects it to come out this year. Like mm -hmm. it would be embarrassing for Google to announce this and have it not come out this year. So I guess we'll have to wait and see. Yeah, definitely gonna have to wait and see there. I mean, it's a bit of a chicken and egg problem. There's a lot of great VR tech out there and there's just for most, not a ton of stuff to do. That's mm -hmm. getting better uh, for, you know, some folks on Rift and Vive and things like that, but still isn't close to what it needs to be. Mm -hmm. Well, everyone wants to talk about their own machine learning, but Google is clearly winning this war, as Jeff Jarvis said on This Week in Google earlier today. He or she who has the most data sets wins the war. Right now, that winner is Google. And today, CEO Sundar Pichai revealed a new machine learning chip in service called Cloud TPU. It's aimed at beating Amazon and Microsoft at the cloud computing game. And as the winner in this so-called war, Google is now giving back. Today, they said they would give a cluster of 1,000 cloud TPUs to researchers for free. Researchers or students can use TPUs or TensorFlow processor unit, that's what it stands for, to train and inference tasks. Google's effort is intended to raise interest in machine learning and eventually to increase the use of Google's cloud services. If you're interested, you can fill out a questionnaire with some basic information about the size and type of your training sets. The formal application process will begin soon, says TechCrunch. This was exciting. I can't say that I completely understand, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it sounds great. Well, the basic idea here, um, and th this is actually one of my kind of gripes with uh, with the keynote today. Uh, uh, as you mentioned earlier, uh, Stacey Higginbottom and myself basically did a play-by-play -play live analysis of the keynote as it was happening. Now, this is one of the most exciting announcements they had at the I.O. keynote but Google really didn't do a great job of translating to the regular people watching out there or just the tech enthusiasts what this could actually mean uh, for future products. But basically the idea is to build out any sort of AI and machine learning, um, you really have to feed it, like you said, tons and tons of data. And uh, this steps up the processing game uh, a ton. Uh, now I'm, I'm doing this off memory, but I think basically it's essentially like having 64 different uh, um, processing units going at the same time. There's been a hurdle before where it was kind of limited to, to like eight and then 16. And so this is a, a significant leap. 
And so they'll just be able to, to process through a lot more data quicker. Um, and if, if they can move through this quicker, the idea is that their system could grow. And if you want to do something with machine learning, you're going to want to go to Google's uh, cloud services. At least that's the sell. That's the promise. Now, what that could actually result in, the idea is, is better products. What those products will do uh, and what problems will help us solve, how they'll make our lives better. Google didn't really say. They basically just said, hey, this is where it's all going. And if you want to build out this sort of technology, come do it with us. And that is kind of the point of a developer's conference is to sell developers. Mm -hmm. So it could be uh, curing cancer. It could be an internet connected salt shaker. You decide. It could be, it could be lots of different things. So we'll see where it goes. Um, but, uh, but yeah, this, this was, this could be like a, a big turning point, uh, uh, for, 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 for Google and for, for AI. And, but again, they didn't really quite communicate that the right way. Well, a quick reminder that you can comment on anything we discuss by emailing TNT at twit.tv and, of course, subscribe to Tech News Today by going to our show page at twit.tv slash TNT. We're going to take a minute here to thank our sponsor. Uh, and this episode is sponsored by Blue Apron, which is, as we said earlier, the number one fresh ingredient and recipe delivery service in the country. Blue Apron's mission is to make incredible home cooking accessible to everyone. And I've been using this lately myself. I got to say it is very easy. Um, they deliver seasonal recipes along with fresh, high-quality ingredients to make delicious home-cooked meals. Each meal comes with a step-by-step, easy-to-follow recipe card and pre-portioned ingredients that can be prepared in 40 minutes or less. One thing that I love about Blue Apron is that these cards, you can hold on to them after, and if you want to repeat the recipe yourself at home, you can do that. If you spend a lot of time and money at restaurants and high-end grocery chains, uh, this will actually help in that regard too because you can now spend under $10 per person for a delicious meal. Blue Apron sets the highest quality standards for their community of over 150 local farms, fisheries, and ranchers across the United States. By shipping the exact amount of each ingredient required for a recipe, Blue Apron is re reducing food waste. Their freshness guarantee promises that every ingredient in your delivery arrives ready to cook or they'll make it right. Blue Apron delivers to 99% of the continental US and there's no weekly commitment, so you only get deliveries when you want them. Customize your recipes every week based on your dietary preferences. Choose from a variety of new recipes each week or let Blue Apron's culinary team surprise you. Recipes are not repeated within a year, so you're never going to get bored. Bake spinach and egg flatbread with sauteed asparagus and lemon aioli. Beef teriyaki stir fry with sugar snap peas and lime rice. Crispy salmon and roasted potato salad with pickled mustard seeds and creme fraiche sauce. Three cheese and baby broccoli stromboli with tomato, oregano, and dipping sauce. I love reading these parts because they all sound so good. Check out this week's menu and get three meals free with your first purchase and free shipping by going to blueapron.com slash TNT. You're going to love how good it feels and tastes to create incredible home-cooked meals with Blue Apron. Don't wait. Go to blueapron.com slash TNT. Blue Apron, a better way to cook. Like I said before, you and Stacey did a great job in the keynote. You can thanks, watch that. Thanks. You can download that at Twit. And then also you can hear more about Google I.O. Uh, at the uh, at This Week in Google. And Leo's still there. Jason's still there. We might hear from them tomorrow. Uh, but here's the rest of the news. Earlier this week, in the wake of the WannaCry ransomware attack, Microsoft President and Chief Legal officer Brad Smith called for a digital con Geneva convention. Smith was advocating for governments to treat cyber weapons in the same way they treat nuclear weapons. And according to ZDNet, it appears that lawmakers were listening, some of them at least. Congress has introduced bipartisan legislation to increase government transparency in disclosing cyber vulnerabilities to the private sector. Now, many believe that the WannaCry was unleashed upon the world as a result of stockpiled NSA hacking tools. So this, this is good news. Um, the bill is cited as protection, protecting our ability to counter hacking attack of 2017, which stands for patch. Uh, the bill, <laughs> <laughs> no. Of course good. it does. <laughs> good, good acronym. Uh, it mandates the development of a policy on how government reveals zero days. So it's, you know, there is, there is some policy there, but it hasn't been updated. And there's also support from the industry and security groups. Yeah, I got I got to say I'm somewhat encouraged by this move. This seems like the way that the private sector tech companies should be collaborating uh, with the government 
uh, when it comes to security and privacy and, and, you know, all these things, there could be some consumer protections here, but of course there are like governmental level uh, protections as well. Um, this is somewhat smart. I hope they make this process extremely transparent uh, because so much of what the government does when it works with tech companies or, you know, strong arms them or whatever uh, to, to get data on us as consumers, we never get to hear about, we never really know about. Um, so here's an opportunity uh, to, to do something really special. I think that could make sense. Uh, it would be nice if the NSA uh, kind of kept its stuff together a little bit better because, you know, it, it's, it's, it's weird to think of it, uh, you know, digital tools being like left behind in a closet collecting dust. Um, but essentially that's kind of what happened here. They were neglecting to take care of their stuff and um, potentially some stuff got out in the wild. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, the, the Microsoft of course released a patch back in March, but the hacking tool came out before that. So people had it. And yeah, I mean, I think Brad Smith was exactly right saying, you know, let's treat these the way we should treat them. We should know about them. Mm -hmm. There should be, like you said, transparency. Great. Well, 13 Senate Democrats also published an open letter in TechCrunch today arguing why net neutrality should be kept in place and not revoked by the Federal Communications Commission, as the current FCC chairman, Ajit Pai, has said is a priority for him. The letter is addressed to everyone who uses the internet, so not vague at all, and notes that tomorrow the FCC will vote to initiate a process to repeal net neutrality rules that have been in place since 2015. The letter points out three ways uh, that undoing net neutrality would be bad, by letting internet service providers create what are called fast lanes for companies that can afford, afford to pay up, by driving up the bills we pay for our internet service as a result of having to pay for extra access to specific sites or services with more speed, and by even allowing ISPs to block us for reaching specific content on the internet, i.e. those who can't pay for fast lanes. Uh, so a lot of government action uh, on the tech side today. Um, you know, this is a great letter and it makes a lot of sense, but I do have... A couple complaints here. Uh, for some reason, the letter ended with the set of senators noting that the FCC is accepting comments right now from the public and, and that in 2014, millions of people commented on the FCC's net neutrality proceedings, which helped us get to the net neutrality rules we have today. But for some reason, the letter didn't actually tell readers how to share their support or distaste for net neutrality within the FCC. So I'm going to take a second to do that here. You can call them at one 888 call FCC, or you can go online and the FCC does not make this easy at all. Um, you can go online and go to the submit a filing section of the website. You can then choose express comment. And in the proceedings box, you have to enter in 14 dash 28 and 17 dash 108. Along there, you can put your comments for or against the FCC's plan to undo net neutrality. More than 1.2 million people have already commented to the FCC on net neutrality this time around. Megan, what do you think? A, a letter in TechCrunch, is that the best place to, to publish such a such a letter? Um, well, you know, it's as good as any. I This is just... I don't think the FCC should be in charge of net neutrality. That's what I, that's what I believe. Like, I, I think this is just kind of messed up. And it's also kind of like, this is why we can't have nice things sort of yeah. thing. Because like when, you know, the first time around, there were all those comments. I heard Ajit Pai interviewed recently and he made the important point that most people don't mention. We don't know whether, how many of those comments, we always say like, oh, there were 4 million comments. We never know if there were, you know, they were all positive. Some might've been, you know, some might've been uh, again, for net neutrality, against net neutrality. We don't know. But it's, I just think it's complicated. And he, and I think that Ajit Pai also, he's not necessarily against net neutrality. I think what he has been quoted as saying is that he rejects the powers that the FCC claim in the name of net neutrality. So it, it is complicated. And, um, but you know, the Minion Clyburn, who is the FCC commissioner, who I really, I really uh, admire her. She says net neutrality is doomed if we're silent. It's a, it's a complicated issue because like I said, we can't have nice things. There were so many comments before then they, you know, the site was crashed. There were FCC bots. They were, you know, trying to leave comments and um, it's just kind of a mess now. And I, and a lot of people say like, oh, we can't, 
go back to the internet fast lanes and slow lanes. It's like, we didn't have that before. I think what a lot of people don't understand is that this is a slippery slope and this is what we don't want. We, we want the internet to stay free and open where it's been free and open, whereas opposed to like, we're not like going back to the bad old days. There were no bad old days. So it's such a complicated issue. And I just feel like at this point, I feel like it's beyond the FCC. Well, who who should who should handle it if not the FCC? Because right, Congress. Right, well, so then just, just well, okay. So the way that it was before was the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission, uh, was basically overseeing any sort of things like what we're talking about here, uh, like uh, 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 an internet service provider charging a specific tech company f uh, for quicker speeds or anything like that. Then. Um, under the previous FCC and during the Obama administration, uh, it was ruled that not quite a public utility, but that this should be classified as a utility. Um, and now, uh, to your point, uh, Pi wants to basically kick it back to the FTC. So mm -hmm. it seems like part of the debate here is, in fact, who should be overseeing the way the Internet works, uh, who should be enforcing uh, uh, things that happen if ISPs treat traffic in different ways. Uh, the way the current uh, net neutrality rules, uh, which Pi has said that he wants to undo, uh, do uh, mandate that all internet service providers treat all traffic the same. So there's actually something that current uh, cell phone carriers and even home carriers are doing, which is called zero rating, where, say, for example, you know, your favorite mu music service on whatever specific carrier uh, uh, doesn't count against your data cap and stuff like that. So some of this has started to happen recently, but you're right. There weren't necessarily any bad old days. Um, it would be interesting to see if Congress actually took this up. And I do wonder if maybe the millions of comments that are coming into the FCC uh, can actually spark something there. Um, because if... Uh, the FCC is actually going to undo the net neutrality rules as they exist currently. And Pi has said that he's going to and not going to be influenced by public opinion or, or mm -hmm. polls. Um, <clears throat> that could be arguably against the will of the people, so to speak. Yeah. I, yeah, it is. I mean, it is such a complicated issue. It and is. I guess what I'm taking issue with is people making it into an easy issue, just like, oh, it's our freedom. We're standing up for our freedom. But it's much more complicated than that. And yeah, I guess we'll just have to to see what what's next. And I'm not I'm not like a huge, you know, Ajit Pai supporter or anything like he worked for Verizon. He was, a you know, he was a lawyer. He was an antitrust lawyer. He has I mean, he's a very smart guy, but I, he's not necessarily on the consumer side. Yeah, he definitely does not seem to be. And, <clears throat> you know, uh, this isn't necessarily a defense of Pi, but previous FCC commissioners have gone and become lobbyists for the telecommunications companies that they're regulating before. So um, the, you know, there's obviously a ton of problems on that side as, as to these people who should be making decisions on behalf of us, arguably not really fighting for us, uh, regular people, uh, um, you know, the public, the electorate, and not necessarily corporate interests. So that's an entirely separate issue, but it is kind of, you know, wound all together in here. It's a big bundle of snakes. It is a big bundle of snakes. That is good. A secure electronic signature company DocuSign has been hacked, opening up its customers to a targeted email phishing campaign. According to Krebs on Security, DocuSign has confirmed the data breach, which includes customer and user email addresses. The malware is expected to spread more quickly because DocuSign customers are expecting to receive attachments from sources that they trust and have been trained to enter all kinds of sensitive information into DocuSign document. So this is a messy one. Another big ball of snakes <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> just all over the place. Because of course, if you've ever had a DocuSign document, it's like you see it, you open it, you do all the things and you move on and yeah. you don't, don't really spend, pay attention. To yeah. It. Yeah. And so this is a, this is perfect for uh, a way to spread malware. So DocuSign has said, you know, the, the documents themselves haven't been breached all, you know, all, all of those papers that you've DocuSigned are not out there, but your name and email address uh, if you, I guess it was not necessarily the signee, but the mm -hmm. customer. So mm -hmm. like if you're, you know, real estate agent used it, it would be, but not necessarily you. That's unclear. And I think it's a developing story. But what they said is the, the phishing email comes from DSE 
at doc at d o u sign so do you sign dot com which looks like docu sign <laughs> it's close enough that it's going to confuse some people you're going to glance at that and not even notice yes and it says so this was it was it said the legal acknowledgement for slash person your your name uh, document is ready for signature. And then if, you, if you've already clicked on a document like this, you might have malware on your system. So go ahead and uh, do a little scrub there if you feel like you have already signed. Yeah, definitely something to look out for. It's, it's I mean, I hate to say it, it's somewhat clever. Uh, a lot of uh, this malware is triggered by you clicking on a link that you shouldn't be clicking on, interacting with an email that you shouldn't be in some way. Um, and posing as something you need to sign is going to get you to click. Uh, uh, they just keep coming up with new ways to mess with us you know? <laughs> it never ends <laughs> well <laughs> apple music will be moving away from one of its so far defining features exclusive albums jimmy Iovine, the record mogul and beats electronics co-founder who now runs apple music told the trade publication music business worldwide that exclusive release releases will soon be more rare inside of its service because record labels feel that exclusives can be detrimental to the overall streaming numbers and thus result in lost revenue. Jimmy did say, however, that occasional exclusive music can still happen if an artist really, really wants to pursue it. Now, uh, you know, we, we've, it's, I guess, over the year, there's, there've been a, a, a few notable uh, records being broken on streaming sites, you know, Drake and Kendrick Lamar and all this stuff. Uh, and exclusives have played into that somewhat. Uh, and Apple really has been paying for exclusives with Drake, with Chance the Rapper, um, uh, with Frank Ocean, a lot of different musicians. Uh, so I got to say, this this kind of surprised me somewhat, but it does make sense from a record label perspective um, that you would want your music everywhere uh, to get it as out there as broadly as possible. But, I, you know, I don't know. Do you what, what music service do you use? I use Apple Music. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, so I... There's never, I'm not that into music that I would switch if someone else had, you know, an exclusive. Like two weeks early or something like <laughs> yeah. that. Yeah. And this, I mean, this makes sense that, um, that they would, because how does it benefit the musician really? And I think mm -hmm. Apple's just trying to make this announcement like, hey, you know, we're for the musician, not just for, you know, our bottom line. So I, I think that this makes sense. Did Kendrick Lamar have an exclusive? Uh, he did not uh, this time around, but uh, there have been some... Some situations where like specific singles were exclusive or uh, one thing that Apple Music is also doing a lot of is uh, situations where musicians will have like radio shows, just a few episodes on their service. So there's some exclusivity there as well. Um, Kendrick Lamar uh, was setting some streaming records earlier this mm -hmm. year uh, and Drake has uh, played with exclusives with Apple in the past as well. Do you know how much percentage uh, like they're touring that that money of like stars, how oh, much money is it? That's most of it. These days, still the majority of money uh, that musicians are making is touring, touring and, and merchandise sales that go along with that. Um, so much so uh, with the decline of record sales um, over the last couple decades and streaming is growing, but not really making up for that. Uh, so much so that nowadays record labels often sign artists to what are called 360 deals, 360 deals, which include uh, touring and things like that before they were signing usually just for albums and promotional stuff and rights to masters. And the, the touring was often separate. Uh, Jay-Z was actually one of the first to kind of switch that up when he started a company called Rock Nation a few years ago. Um, but now it's such a big and core part uh, that oftentimes record labels want a piece of it. Uh, uh, so yeah, streaming still isn't quite the uh, powerhouse of revenue that, that CD sales used to be. Um, interestingly enough, uh, Jimmy Iovine did say in the same interview uh, that free music on streaming services and just free music outside of them as well is so technically good and ubiquitous that it's actually stunting the growth of page streaming. And he said that two things need to happen for this to turn around. Free music has to become more difficult or restricted and paid services have to get better. But I'm curious to see how paid services could get better if they're not offering stuff that nobody else has. I mean, you know, exclusivity on, say, Netflix keeps me a subscriber to Netflix. Mm -hmm. So when he says free music, does he mean like the free tier of Spotify or does he mean someone just illegally downloading music? The way that I read it is is the free tiers on streaming apps, but then also just like the pervasiveness of free music Like anywhere. on YouTube or whatever. Exactly. Mm. And a lot of people use YouTube with 
without ever paying for it, mm-hmm. interestingly enough. Mm-hmm. Well, it's time for TNT's fan of the day. It's me. And it's a very special <laughs> fan of the day. It is Megan Maroney. Our own Megan Maroney tweeted a video of her watching our live stream analysis of the Google I.O. keynote from her home this morning. And her talk, however, wasn't into the show as much as she was. Uh, can we play, pr- press the play button on that video? <laughs> and so I'm talking and the dog just takes off. Not really into it at all. Uh, to be fair, it was not, we cannot blame Stacy for this. This was yesterday's TNT that I was listening to. So it was you and Jason that made him walk away. But it wasn't oh, you. Oh, okay. It was the camera. He does not, I like, I love to take pictures and videos of my dog and I stick the camera in his face. I also like to take pictures and videos of my kids, but yeah. uh, I'm nicer to them and I've stopped sticking my camera in their face. <laughs> but the dog just quietly Well, even, even your Twitter uh, profile photo at the top, the strip across the top is a picture of your dog like yeah. laying on the ground yeah. doing her thing. Yeah, sunbathing. He is an awesome dog. Yeah, mm-hmm. awesome. So do you often watch, okay, when you watch mm-hmm. Twit at home, mm-hmm. and I don't get to normally ask fans this, <laughs> do you do you watch yourself or do you just watch like all the shows that you're not on or like how does that work? I watch the shows that I'm not on. Oh, I okay. do not watch myself. No, I have a very large TV and I don't know how you people watch me on it. <laughs> I can't. <laughs> you're great. I love watching you. <laughs> love watching you on shows. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Show us how you watch TNT, record a video, take a picture of yourself, your setup, post it on Instagram, Google Plus, Twitter, or Facebook. Use the hashtag how I watch TNT and we'll, we'll, we will find it. After the break, is your yacht secure from hackers? Find out. But first, let's thank Rocket Mortgage from Quicken Loans. Now, the only thing more frustrating than getting your yacht hacked is getting a mortgage. Full disclosure, I have never gotten my yacht hacked because I don't have a yacht, but I did have a mortgage and I still do have a mortgage. I did have to get one and it was super frustrating. And when it comes to the big decision for you of choosing a mortgage lender, it's important to work with someone who you can trust, who has your best interest in mind. With Rocket Mortgage, you'll get a transparent online process that gives you the confidence to make an informed decision. Don't waste time searching through stacks of paperwork. With Rocket Mortgage, you can securely share your financial info to get a mortgage approval in minutes. You can even adjust the rate and the length of your loan in real time to make sure you get the mortgage solution that's right for you. So whether you're looking to buy a house, new house, your first house, your second house, your last house, who cares? Any house you're looking to buy, or maybe you're already happy in your house and you've looked into refinancing and you know now is the time to refinance your existing mortgage. I'm not telling you now is the time, but if you know that now is the time, you can lift that burden of getting a home loan with Rocket Mortgage. So go ahead and skip the bank, skip the waiting you can go completely online at quickenloans.com slash TNT. That's quickenloans.com slash TNT, equal housing lender, licensed in all 50 states, NMLS, consumeraccess.org, number 3030. And we thank Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans for their support. So just a warning for all of those of you out there with super yachts, your super yacht can be hacked in less than an hour, according to Slate, the 100 foot long, $275 million super yachts don't have the greatest Wi Fi security. Uh, a talk at the latest Super Yacht Investor Conference claims a break in is easy and grants a cyber criminal access to your banking information, which apparently is probably very valuable if you're going around buying super yachts. Uh, also, access to your emails and more. A hacker might even be able to gain access to the ship's navigational system and sail you right off course. You know, this really pisses me off so much. I'm going to get rid of my super yacht now. I am so, I just, you know, <laughs> I just, oh, I just so mad about it. I don't even know. So I didn't mad. even know what a super yacht was. Did you know what a super yacht was? Yeah, of course I knew what a super yacht was. <laughs> it's really a really Come big on, one. Megan. It's a very, very big yacht. <laughs> yeah. Usually multiple stories. Uh, I think, I think Johnny Ive actually designed one for Steve uh, Jobs before Steve uh, Jobs passed away, I believe. I could be wrong. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, they're huge. But no, but no, I mean, jokes aside, um, this is actually pretty fascinating because I'm sure a lot of people are just putting in like the same unsecure router that they've had in there, you know, the little like Blue Links of Spock they, they bought 15 years ago or something. Um, uh, you know, this is such an easy, simple vulnerability. Uh, it, you know, it, it really, it really makes sense. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, yeah. mm-hmm. unfortunately, but hopefully it's being fixed now that this has been revealed. I, I hope the super yacht owners know. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, 
you know, just like home Wi-Fi, uh, going with systems that automatically update themselves, get security patches, uh, are easier to use. Uh, that's the way to go. Protecting mm -hmm. passwords. Uh, um, I mean, the the same simple approach that you should be taking to protecting your home Wi-Fi network is is what you should be using in a super watt, super yacht, a uh, yacht. <laughs> I can't even say. I have so many of them. I can't even say it. <laughs> and I travel so internationally, my accents well, get messed up. I so. found that I like had a hard time writing the word, like because I was like, is that really how it's spelled? Because like I I have so seldom do I have the opportunity to write the word yacht. Yeah. <laughs> That's how far away I am from actually owning a yacht. But if I had one, I would have secure Wi-Fi on it. You know, if you got a paddle boat, you got to secure your Wi-Fi. You yeah, know what I'm exactly. Saying? I, you know, you got, mm -hmm. you're sitting in a kiddie pool. Mm -hmm. Make sure your Wi-Fi is secure. There's no <laughs> excuse. Super knot or not, man. You like, you know, playing your bathtub with like your little rubber ducky. Make sure your Wi-Fi is legit. Mm -hmm. All right. I think we've beaten, beaten that <laughs> enough. TNT records live every Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern, 2300 UTC at twit.tv slash live. And you can be a part of the show by emailing us at TNT at twit.tv or by leaving us a short voicemail at 260-TNT-SHOW. You can also hit us up on Twitter at Tech News Today TV. You can also find us on our subreddit. That's technewstoday.reddit.com and subscribe to the show so you are the first person to get it. Go to twit.tv slash TNT. Find all the ways to subscribe. And if you want to tweet at me, tweet me some pictures of your yacht. I met Megan Maroney. And I met Nate OG. I wouldn't mind seeing your yacht either. <laughs> Thanks to our technical director, Brian, Burke for helping out in the studio, Kevin for editing the show, and thank you for talking tech with us today. We'll see you tomorrow. <laughs>